please turn with me to Deuteronomy and chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. It's Father's Day and um, I want to share with you a very unusual Father's Day message. A very serious one and a very unconventional one. So uh, I hope I don't upset too many, but I believe that it's very important for us to speak on these things. And so I'm going to take a reading from Deuteronomy chapter 22. In fact, Deuteronomy 22 is, a, uh, is an amazing chapter, uh, one of those chapters that we normally ignore because we don't understand most of, most of it. Um, and in fact, Deuteronomy 21, and maybe I'll start reading there, um, contains the verses that were quoted concerning the Lord Jesus, cursed is any man who hangs upon a tree. Um, and so that's from Deuteronomy 21, verse 22. So let's read this, the section, and then I'll, um, I'll find some way of uh, making a connection with this passage. Deuteronomy 21, uh, then verse 22. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and hide yourself from them. You shall certainly bring them back to your brother. And if your brother is not near you or if you do not know him, then you shall bring it to your own house and shall remain with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. You shall do the same with his donkey, and so shall you do with his garment. With any lost thing of your brother's, which he has lost and you have found, you shall do likewise. You shall not hide yourself. You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fall down along the road and hide him, yourself from them, and you shall surely help him lift them up again. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on woman's garment for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. If a bird's nest happens to be uh, before you along the way, in any tree or on the ground, with young ones or eggs, with a mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself, that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof, uh, this is really a guardrail, that you may not bring guilt or bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. You shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed, lest, you heal, lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as wool and linen mixed together. You shall make tassels on the four corners of the clothing with which you cover yourself. Now, uh, I can see some puzzled faces uh, wondering what this is all about. <clears throat> and I'm not going to comment on the whole passage because obviously he's dealing with a number of different things. But one of the things that he deals with here is the issue of mixture which I've touched on before in different contexts. And so you'll see from verse 9, you shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed, lest the yield of your seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as wool and linen mixed together. And obviously these laws don't apply to us uh, any longer, but they contain principles which apply to us. Um, if we were to apply the letter of this law, then, then all of us in this church today would be in trouble because it's guaranteed that every one of us has clothing that is made up of a mixture of polyester and wool and silk and uh, all sorts of other amazing things. Um, there is not one here I'm absolutely con convinced of uh, that, has, that is dressed only in cotton or in wool or whatever, whatever it may be. But the principle of mixture... Is, and that is really what God is dealing with here. And obviously there were, there were technical reasons why these laws were in place at the time. 
Um, this does not obviously deal with issues like hybrid, hybridization in our, uh, all of the food that we eat today are hybrids, they are mixtures. Um, and then we have gone another level beyond that with uh, uh, genetically modified uh, things. Um, the, the scripture has nothing to say about those things, um, I, I don't believe. But what it does say is that God does not want mixture. You remember that when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, there was with them what they call, what the scripture calls a mixed multitude. These were people who were neither Jews nor Egyptians. They were a mixture, men who had married Egyptian wives and the other way around. And that was where the trouble always began. And of course we have heard about sanctification today and the problem with sanctification is that God wants purity and he wants purity in our hearts and in our motives and in our actions uh, and yet what we do so successfully is that we mix things and we mix spirituality with carnality, uh, the things of the world and the things of God, the sacred and the profane. We mix these things together and we, we become very good at doing that kind of thing. In fact, we have a, a, a whole word for it in, in theology called syncretism. Syncretism means putting things together, making things mesh that don't belong together. Um, and so we take idolatry and we mix it together with Christianity and so on. So that, that really is the, is the purpose of the passage. Now, in this we have a verse which is uh, very controversial in some quarters, and that is verse 5. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on woman's garment, for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. And so what I'm going to preach about this morning is women's, women wearing slacks. <laughs> well, obviously you know me better than that. But that's what this verse is normally used for, saying that women may not wear slacks. Now, I, th that's not the intent of this verse. And remember that, that if you're going to apply this verse in its literal sense of saying, well, women may not wear slacks or pants, um, then you have to apply the rest of this passage. And you may not eat, uh, well, then you, you, you're not going to eat today. Because, you, because everything that we eat is, is a mixture, is a hybrid uh, of different uh, kinds of, of, uh, of foods and so on. So clearly the point here is that there's a principle here. And that is what we need to extract from these uh, ceremonial and uh, health laws that God instituted. And, and it's that principle that I want to speak with you about this morning. The principle is that a woman should not look like a man. And a man should not look like a woman. That principle does not change. And we find that throughout scripture. I think that partly what, what has motivated me to speak today on this subject is that we, <clears throat> we happen to be in a very important month of the year. It is what month? Pride month. Pride month. And the problem with pride month is that it used to be something that was out there in the world. That is what the world did. and. The church said we're, we're different. We don't accept that kind of lifestyle. Now, be, before I continue, and, and I'm not going to speak about homosexuality as such. You, you'll, you'll, you'll hopefully get the point that I'm trying to make in a few moments. But at the same time, we, we are not against homosexual people. We love them. We want to see them saved and born again. But at the same time, the scripture is clearly against that lifestyle. And for the church to accept that lifestyle becomes an abomination before God. Because we're doing exactly what I spoke about a moment ago. We're mixing the world and its lifestyle with Christianity. And so I was, I was horrified this week when uh, a friend of mine sent me a photograph from, or a picture from, from, from England. And in England there is a a publishing house called Cambridge University Press. And you may have heard of Cambridge University Press. You, in fact, may have a Bible that is printed by Cambridge University Press. They are the oldest Bible publishing house in the world. And they publish 
uh, a very big percentage of the Bibles in the world. And, and in England they hold the copyright, although the King James doesn't really have a copyright um, in England, it does have a copyright. Um, and by the order of the Queen, uh, Cambridge University Press holds the copyright on the King James Bible. So you can't print the King James Bible in England unless you have permission from Cambridge University Press. Now, they had a very special week, and in order to celebrate Pride Month, they are offering a 20% discount on Bibles. And they have outside, and the picture was of their bookshop, bookshop in, in Cambridge. Now, I've never been to the bookshop. I've always wanted to go there because there's a particular Bible that I'm, uh, I've always uh, lusted after um, that they sell. Um, but I never, I never got so far. But anyway, outside of the, of the store is the gay flag. And this is, this is the mixture that the scripture speaks about here. But that's not really the point that I want to deal with this morning. What I want to deal with really is the essence of this verse. And the essence of this verse is that women must be women and men must be men. They are not to be mixed. They are not... They, they're not to, the one is not to look like the other. And, and just by the way, we, we spoke about uh, slacks and slack suits. Um, I, I don't believe that that necessarily constitutes women dressing like men. Um, I, I, I don't think Roger would look very good in a woman's pair of slacks. Um, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, the point here is that men need to look like men and women need to look like women. But it goes far beyond that. It goes to the essence of their behavior and it goes to the essence of who they, they are. A, an idea which is very popular today called sexual identity. How do you identify? And really, if I have to interpret this verse, just for you very quickly in, into modern English, what this verse is saying is men must identify as men and women must identify as men. That's what he is saying. Men must be men and women must be women. And we know that from the very beginning, God created man in his own image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female he created them. Now, I'm not dealing with this to offend you, but at the same time, I'm dealing with this because I believe that we need to get back to the Scriptures. And this has always been the goal of my teaching, and certainly the purpose of this church, is to get back to the Word of God. And the, and the problem is that we find that what society does is it slowly but surely... Uh, changes our thinking so that we slowly but surely move away from the biblical pattern and adapt our thinking to that of the world. And I have no doubt that in 20 years time this kind of message would be maybe frowned upon today. It will certainly land me in jail in 20 years time. And so let me preach it while I still have the opportunity. God did not make men, women, and others. Folk, it's pretty simple. It's pretty clear that the way he made, it, made us was male and female. He didn't make... I, I don't get the alphabet suit, super. It, it changes every week. LGBT, IOU, USA, whatever. Every week they add new varieties to the end of the, of the acronym. Every week we come up with new variations. But God only made two options, male and female. Those are the only options. And the scripture in Deuteronomy then says that what we need to do is we need to act and behave within the parameters of what God made us to be. How God made us. If we are men, we need to act as men. 
We need to behave like men. We need to dress like men. We need to do the things that men do. Now, the other problem we have when we deal with this, with this idea is that there was a time, and, and in some cultures and in some parts of American culture, it's still there, that the, the thought was that to be a man means to be a brute, to be an animal, to be uncultured, to be rude, to be insensitive. And in the last 20, 30 years, we've gone through a whole change of thinking in the world that men need to discover their feminine side. Men need to learn to be sensitive. Now, folk, there is truth in those things. The idea that men are uncouth animals is not a biblical idea. And remember then, we, we heard in the prayer this morning that our model as a father is our heavenly father. All of us as earthly fathers are weak and frail, and we fail in many, many ways. But our heavenly father does not fail. God is not uncouth. God is not unmannered. God is not a brute. God is not a savage. He is none of those things. God is in the best way that I can describe it, a gentleman. God is sensitive to our needs. God loves us. God is gracious. God is, is kind. These are attributes which in some cultures we push out of the, the equation and we say, well, men aren't those kinds of things. Now, folks, here's the difficulty. And we need to look at the Father. And the Father is able to not really able, he's just in his essence, is both gentle but strong. Both of these things at the same time, they are, not, they are not mutually exclusive to the point where I have to be one or the other. And the problem is that, that, men have, uh, that culture is pushing men further and further away from being men because it's now unpopular to, for men to exert themselves as men and to do manly things. And so men need to become more feminine in their approach, in the way that they do things. Now, we've got to find that balance. And it's a difficult balance. And as fathers, and I'm really addressing fathers, as fathers we need to show our sons particularly an example of a man who is soft and broken before God. But at the same time who is strong and firm when it comes to defending truth and when it comes to defending what is right and what is wrong. A man who is able to be, be humble before God and yet at the same time is able to take leadership in his family. A man who is able to love, but is also able to discipline when discipline is necessary. These are difficult things for us to balance. And pastors particularly find it difficult. And so you find some pastors are over soft and licentious, and they let everything go because they don't want to, they don't want to seem to be hard. And other pastors are legalistic and they beat the people up with a rod all the time it's a very difficult thing I know to find a balance between these two things as a spiritual father and as a earthly father and yet we're able to look to our Heavenly Father and we're able to find that example in him now let me also say that before I get to the next verse that the Th this whole thing is not about inferiority and superiority. It's not about who is better. I don't believe that men are better than women. And I don't believe that women are better than men. But we are different. I've said this a long time ago and I need to repeat it again. We are different. We are not the same. We are equal before God, but we are different, and we are made differently because He made us in the beginning, man and male and female. 
He didn't make them male and just make them look slightly different, but he made the way that we act and the way we react and our emotions and our feelings and the way that we do things and the way we think. All of these things are different. And yet we live in a time when we want to get rid of those differences and we all want to mix it, we want to mix it all up. And in the process, we really mess up the beautiful design that God had for us. And so the, the point is that we have different, we are different, and therefore we have different roles. And those roles do not infer superiority or inferiority. And I know that this is a difficult thing for us to understand, and I don't want to get into that because we're going to lose the time. But we must discover our God-given role in society, in the family, and in the body of Christ. You see, unfortunately, the world's thinking is that those who sit in Washington are more important than everybody else. That's just the way we think. Those who sit in Sacramento, they're more important. But in fact, the intent originally was that they were to be the servants of the people. But now they become the bosses. Husbands are to lead their families as servants to their families, not as bosses to their families. You see, we, we struggle to get these things straight, but we need to get them straight. The fact that I am a co-leader of this church does not mean that I'm a big chief, but that I'm the servant of this church. And I'm very aware of that. And you know that how I oppose those who set themselves up as lords over God's heritage and um, want to be worshipped and served and bowed and scraped to. We're simply those who serve in the serving and the ministering of the Word of God and in the other ways in which God uh, helps us to do. And so we need to understand and identify those different roles. You say, well, brother, you haven't got to the New Testament yet. And the time's up. So let's get to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Now here's a very difficult verse and I, I don't want to spend too much time on the technicalities of it. Let me read it quickly. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So he's, he's giving us a list of people who are excluded from heaven. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. And then the list goes on. Now, one of the problems we have today with translations is that the translations are sometimes affected by cultural norms. At the end of this list, that I, of this verse, not the end of the list, but the end of this verse, there are two words translated in the New King James as homosexuals or sodomites. And I know Carol is looking at hers and she's finding a different word. The New American Standard says effeminate nor homosexuals. That second last word, excluding nor of course, the second last word effeminate, that is the correct translation of that, of that word. And only the English Standard Version, if I remember correctly, and the New American Standard Bible translated correctly. All the other translations, some of them, the NIV just combines those two words, effeminate and homosexuals, into one, into one word. Um, and, 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 and in this case, oh, sorry, let's go back to, in, in the case of the New King James, uh, homosexuals or sodomites, uh, it's just not there in the original. The, the original word, which is translated homosexuals here, effeminate, the, the original word is soft. That is what the word literally means. Soft. You say, well, what does that mean? I think we all understand what soft means in the sense, well, maybe we don't, but certainly in my culture in South Africa, when we speak about somebody, a, a man who is soft, what does that mean? means he's limp-wristed. He's weak. He doesn't have courage. 
He is effeminate. Effeminate means he is like a woman. Now, remember that when, when and, and please don't get your hackles up. When he's speaking about effeminate, he's not saying that it's, it's a bad thing to be a woman. Because that's how, the, how some people will read this. That it's a bad thing to be a woman and so men mustn't be like women. No, it's a good thing to be a woman. But it's a bad thing for a man to be like a woman. It's a bad thing for a man to be effeminate, to act and behave and dress like a woman. The reason why we know that that translation is correct in the, in the American standard is because in Matthew chapter 11, it speaks about John the Baptist. And this word appears only four times, by the way. It appears in Corinthians, the one I just shown you. It appears twice here in Matthew, and then it appears in Luke, which is the same as Matthew speaking about John the Baptist. He says, what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments. Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. And obviously the picture here, and, and, and I'm not suggesting, just very quickly, I'm not suggesting that we must all wear camel skins and... Uh, and eat wild locusts and honey. But the point that the scripture is making is that John the Baptist was not a soft man. He was not effeminate. He was not a prince who lived in a palace and was sheltered and who, 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 who wasn't a real man. But he was a real man. And he lived out in the field. And we, 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 we've been seeing about Esau and Jacob. And Esau was a man of the field. Esau was this kind of man. But the problem was that Esau took it to an extreme and he became a brute who followed his natural instincts and was not willing to submit to God. The difference between Jacob and Esau is that Jacob, and some translations actually use that word about Jacob, says that he was a soft man. But he was soft, not in the sense that he was effeminate. You can see in his lifestyle that he was not effeminate. But he was soft towards God. He was tender as far as the things of God and God's will and God's word was concerned. Whereas Esau was hard as far as those things were concerned. But here we see then that, that John the Baptist was not effeminate. And so if we go back to the verse then that that I, I want to deal with in, in closing. In fact, it's not my last verse, but second last verse. What Paul is saying here is those, literally, and I'm, I'm taking a little bit of liberty, but I'm, I believe I'm within the parameters of the meaning of this text. Those men who act and dress like women will not enter the kingdom. Now that's a serious statement. And we say, well, why is this such a problem? Well, obviously it's a problem because it's linked to the idea of transsexualism and it's linked to the idea of homosexuality because that's where it leads. And that's one of the important points I want to make to the fathers here this morning. We, 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 we very recently in this last year or two, or two probably just in this last year, uh, have found a, a whole overreaction to this whole thing, and so, so now you go to, well, you can't even go to Toys R Us anymore, but you go to a toy store, and they're not allowed to sell t toys that are boys' toys and girls' toys. And there's an agenda behind that, and the agenda is exactly this. Boys need to become like girls, and girls need to become like boys. Folk, no, boys must be raised as boys. And girls as girls. And you say, well, what, what, if, my, what if my girl wants to be a, a boy? or if my girl? They don't get a choice. The idea that exists in some school districts and in some legal districts today that children of four, five, and six years can choose their gender is an abomination before God. Kids don't get brains before they're 30 years old. I'm serious. 
And at five, they certainly don't have the brains to choose right from wrong when it comes to these kinds of things. And God sees this as a very, very serious thing. And folk, the point of my message this morning is that we, we're drifting and that the church in general is drifting further and further and further and closer and closer to that kind of lifestyle. One of the biggest evangelical denominations, I'm not going to mention the name in America, has just chosen a new president this last week. The second point on his agenda is to develop cultural, what he calls cultural diversity. But that's a euphemism, it's a nice way of saying, including all sorts. Including all sorts. This is the biggest evangelical denomination in America. There are dozens of that church around us here right now. In fact, that's where we're drifting. That's where we're going. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13. And again, I'm quoting from the New American Standard because the others have translated this differently. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Be strong. New King James, instead of act like men, says be brave. And I can understand where they get that from. But that is not the original Greek. The Greek literally says men must behave like men. Remember, I didn't say as brutes, but men must act and behave like men. And this is one of Paul's final admonitions to the Corinthians in this first letter. Remember, a church which faced the same cultural situation that we have today. And you may remember that when we dealt with the book of Corinthians, we said that we could just as well have named these books first and second Californians. Because the cultural situation was identical to our cultural situation. And Paul concludes this letter and he says, men need to be men. Brothers, you need to set an example in your family of what a godly man looks like. Because children follow those examples. Now I don't have anyone in particular in mind. I don't think that there are brothers in our church, and I know there are no brothers in our church who are effeminate. And if I may be so blunt, there may be some who are maybe a little bit far on the other side. But may God help us that we set an example to our boys what a godly man looks like acts like, decides like, believes like, loves like, that we may reflect our Heavenly Father. Remember that verse that I quote so many times in Romans, Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God. Two aspects which in our human thinking we say are in in incompatible. They can't be brought together. And yet God is good and He's severe at the same time. God is loving, but he is righteous and he's just at the same time. And these things need to be brought together uh, in, a, in our, uh, in our uh, thinking, but in particularly in our, in our lifestyle. But then let me close with a, with a warning then and say that if, the, and, and we have many young children in our, in our church and I, and I pray that we will not give them the opportunity to choose being anything other than what God has made them to be. God has made them to be boys and girls. And they need to be raised, they need to be given an example of being young women and young men in the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for your help in these things. Lord, these are very difficult subjects. They are things that are very controversial. And Lord, I understand there may be some in the service this morning and maybe some who watch the recording who may have great difficulty with what we have shared. But Lord, I pray that we may hear your word. And Lord, that we may order our lives according to your word and not according to the norms of our society. Lord, that we may not be like Lot who pitched his tent closer and closer to Sodom until he found himself living in that terrible city. But Lord, that we may like Abraham pitch our tent far away from the world and from its way of doing things and its way of believing. 
And Lord, that we may be those people that are called out to be different and to be uh, uh, modeling our lives after you and after your example and your word and not after the world. Help us, Lord, we pray. We pray, Lord, for every father here this morning, Lord, that they have a, a difficult job trying to be the men that you want them to be. Pray, Lord, for every father that you would strengthen each one of us. Lord, that we may be the men that you want us to be. Lord, that we may not be brutal or brutish, but Lord, that we may be loving and gentle and kind. But Lord, Lord that we may also be strong and brave. And Lord, that we may be those who set an example as to what God is like in our families. Lord, I pray for the young boys and the toddlers, Lord, even, and the babies who are uh, only a few months old. But our boys, Lord, I pray that you would help them and that you would protect them from the attacks of the evil one. And Lord, that you would indeed, as, as they go to school and they're in, being indoctrinated by these things, I pray that you would keep their hearts and minds uh, within the parameters of the safety of your word. And so, Lord, help us, we pray. Help us, Lord, to not be judgmental concerning those who are different to us and who believe differently. But, Lord, help us to love them and, Lord, to point them to the Lord Jesus, who is the answer to every situation. And so, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for Henry. We thank you for the 98 years that you've spared him and the 81 years, Lord, that he's been a believer and a Christian. We thank you, Lord, for his great example as a, uh, as a faithful brother and man of God. And Lord, I pray for your greater blessing and, and anointing upon him for this new year, and Lord, that you would spare him for, for many more years for us. And Lord, that he may be able to minister to us and teach us by his life and his example and by his word. And so, Lord, we pray, go with us, keep us, and protect us. Bring us together again safely in the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.